There we go. Okay. Let us know when you're ready there, Doug. We're just going to get a record here so that yeah, we can, we can uh, send out this. <laughs> By the way, now that I can read those three names, it'd be a good idea if you join us. And, oh. <laughs> oh. and uh, Connie Orr is going to introduce uh, the the interview E. Yes. Mm -hmm. Don't give anything away, Connie. <laughs> no, John. We'll cut this out of the paper. If the examiner can put it in the paper, I can read it here. Um, John Grills was born and, and educated in Lakefield. He lives on one end of the, the Regent Street, and King and I live down on the other end of Regent. Uh, John went to graduate from Lakefield Public and High School. Then he went into Peterborough Normal School and taught school at is it Pine Grove or Garbutz? Lang first. Lang. Then Garbutz. Then Garbutz. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, he decided to move on and went to Toronto, and you were in the Pickering area somewhere. No, I was in Scarborough. See? <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Oak Ridges before I was in Scarborough. <laughs> all right. Okay. Neil will get all that out. And, and John was he uh, in, in the Toronto area for. I don't know how many years. I couldn't phone him and ask him, so you see, I'll just ask him here. How many years did you teach in Toronto? Uh, well, I was in Scarborough, 26 and a half, and three and a half in, at Oak Ridges. Uh-huh. So, and then two at Lang and two at Garbutz. So, and, and he was a busy, busy man with all the other things he did. But John retired and came home when his mother uh, wasn't well, and after his father died. His father worked for the Ontario Hydro for a number of years in the Uh But if you think John came home and retired, he did, he did all <laughs> kinds of things. He was very, very busy with the uh, library. He, he uh, had his music. He, he supplied uh, an Music and a number of churches, Young's Point, uh, Warsaw, Lakefield, and and uh, he also w is very interested in in pets. John's always had a dog. Um, John has helped. Oh. And this year he took up walking on the New Millennium Trail. Isn't he that? walks miles every morning. Okay. Uh, he also is, was very interested in the young people around his area and has helped, oh, all kinds of them who needed some coaching and uh, just to get along. And John's done that. John dogs. You'll see him out walking with his dog. His music has taken up a very, very large part of his his life. His Aunt Laura was a piano teacher and taught for a number of years. So the music in the, in the uh, Grills family comes from his father's side of the mm -hmm. family. His, his other grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Herb Brown, had an ice cream parlor on the corner of Regent and Queen for a number of years. The only ice cream place we had in Lakefield, except uh, the commercial, and we could go to the commercial and get an ice cream cone. Nielsen. Nielsen, yeah. Uh, but John has always been more than willing to help everybody that needs help. And I can tell you very honestly that the there were some Lakefield seniors that certainly wouldn't have ha survived nearly as long if John uh, Grills hadn't gone in and checked on them every year and did a lot of things for them. Uh, and, and we're most thankful, John, for all the things you're doing in Lakefield right now. 
and, and being a part of this, uh, of this organization. If you don't know the date, ask John. <laughs> <laughs> and we will now, you can just fire the questions at us. <laughs> oh, Neil's going to do it. Neil's going to do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I can go and sit well, down. Well, thank you very much, Connie. Uh, my name is Neil Watson, and I've been uh, asked to interview John this evening. I had a number of questions that I was going to ask him, but you covered them all. So I'd, like thank, <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, John, uh, one thing I'd ask is that you speak up and not mumble. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who I'll, knows John. I'll do my best. <laughs> yeah, he, knows right. he has a very distinct, clear voice. Uh, had he not gone into the teaching profession, I'm sure he could have made it as a radio announcer, and he wouldn't have needed the airwaves. No. <laughs> John, it's a pleasure. I don't know how you get all these people out. Are you paying them? <laughs> Bribing. No. Bribing, yes. I yeah. yes. Bought my own cheering section. Are you throwing a cheese and sherry party Absolutely. at your place after or something? <laughs> yes. We're all invited. Yes, it's a, uh, as a compliment to you, it certainly is a tribute to have a number of people come out like this to hear you interviewed. So I hope and we hope that you have something important to say. <laughs> Fire away. John, let's talk about your family a little. Uh, when did you come to Canada, the Grills family? Well, they, they came from Eglisterry, Cornwall, uh, which is right near Launceston. It's a char about, about as big as Young's Point. And my great-great-grandfather died, and he left the family estates and all that. It wasn't a state, a big farm and all this sort of business. To his firstborn son. Well, the firstborn son immediately sold it. Everything. Sold out. Moved to London. Bought a school for his two old maid daughters and set them up in a, in a school in London. <laughs> now, my great-grandfather was the second one in the packing order. So he got two one-way tickets to Canada. <laughs> All right? And a little bit of capital. The rest of them got zilch. And when I visited them, they kept reminding me that their grand great grandfather didn't even get a cow. I heard more about that cow. I was willing to thought I'd like to go out and buy them one. Send them one over. Send them one over. But it might have got hoof mouth disease or wherever to be now. Yeah. Um, my great grandfather married a lady by the name of An Annie Down, and they were married. Uh, by the Reverend H. A. Simcoe, who was the youngest son of the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Town, who died when he was very young. Lady Simcoe lived in Eglisgarry, and they knew her. She lived to be 90-something, and they knew Lady Simcoe. And the Reverend Mr. Simcoe wanted to get as many Cornish boys as possible to Canada, and he established a school, one for girls and one for boys, and they taught them how to live in Canada, how to do this, how to do that. So that's how they got. They came in April of 1853. Yeah, you came in April 1853. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And uh, why did you come to the Lakefield area? Well, they, the, they, um, there were Downs that were still out here, and they were out in Smith Township, and they went there first. Well, they were a relative or something. Yeah, my like grandmother's great grandmother's maiden name was Downs. They were yes. relatives of hers, uh -huh. and then they. Uh, they rented a farm. I see. And where did they, like, when they came this area, they rented a farm. And from whom did they rent They rented it from Joe Nelson. Not one of our Nelson. <laughs> our Joe. <laughs> well, and uh, so they were, uh, they were helping to, uh, to fuel the hierarchy that we are paying homage to shortly. That's absolutely uh, right. And I've no doubt the Browns have a high, or the uh, Grills have a high regard for the Nelsons. How was he as a landlord? Well, first of all, uh, the government did a survey of farms, and um, I found it quite by accident in the Peterborough archives. I wasn't looking for it, and I made a copy of it. I didn't mean anything to me, how many bushels to the acre, acres to the bushel, or whatever. It wasn't mean a thing to me. So I took it down to Bob Hunter, who had farmed all his life, and he said he was running a pretty good operation. So it uh, the, wasn't a very nice house they lived in. The roof leaked. 
And so he went to Joe Nelson one day and he said, look, is there anything you can do to fix the, the roof? And Joe Nelson said, if five cents would make you comfortable, I would be against paying it. <laughs> so there we go. Well, I can understand that, John. I had a fellow ask me to buy him a drink the other day. He said, will you buy me a beer, Neil? And I said, if I was giving away free beer, you'd be president of the Lakefield Temperance Society. <laughs> so but, anyway, there so we go. He, John is, uh, He's a little dubious about the Nelsons, <laughs> but that's a wonderful story, and I well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, all because, right. But the Nelsons chose good land, you know. Oh, I know. Of, yeah. I know. It was yeah. a good farm. Good farm. Yeah. 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 Now, let's talk about your mother, who uh, uh, I knew quite well, as mm -hmm. I did your father. Uh, what was your mother's maiden name? Brown. Uh -huh. Mamie, Mamie Brown, and they were Irish Protestants from County Armagh uh -huh. in, in Ireland. And... Uh, one uh, one fellow who was well known in the village of Lakefield was your grandfather. Yes, Mr. Herb Brown. Herb Brown, and yeah. he was a friend to many. I'm sure uh, there are many people here who have uh, did business with your grandfather. Yes, I imagine. Would you yeah. tell us a little bit about him? Why was he so well known? Well, he, I don't know. He he was a a very fantastic man. Um, first of all. Um, I remember once I asked him, I was when he was in his 80s, he was in his 80s, and I said, what do you think was the greatest mistake you ever made in your life? <laughs> now most men would say, well, gee, you know, I, let, let me think about that. He said in the election of 19, provincial election of 1919, I didn't vote for the Conservatives, I voted for the United Farmers of Ontario, E.C. Drury. He said they didn't do a darn thing for the farmers. So he said, that was the biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> so anyway, when I left the party one time to vote for the reformers and, the, and then, God help me, the alliance, I think the Bible calls that whoring after strange gods. <laughs> All right? Well, anyway, my aunt would kept reminding me of what she'd say. Now, you remember what your grandfather said. See, I made the same mistake twice. He only made it once. <laughs> uh, your grandfather and your grandmother, they ran a restaurant, and it was a really a drop-in center for those in oh, Lakeville. Yes. Oh, yeah. It was used by many. They were quite popular because they, your grandfather would let you run up a tab. Oh, yeah, I know. Could you... Uh, and also the Grove Boys would run up a tab, and, and you counseled him one time against that type of activity, did you not? You yes, were worried about I, him and his money, were you not? Yes, I, 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 thought, I said, no, I said, Grandpa, you've got an awful lot of money on the books here. You've got to start calling some of this money in. So, oh, well, he didn't want to worry about it. So finally he got sick of me talking. He said, bring the books here. He said, what's the first name on the book? I said, Rick Crank. He said his father is J.H. Krang, the stockbroker. Now, you don't think that J.H. Krang is good for $2. <laughs> and he went down the list, and he knew what every one of them did. The next guy whose father was president of Face Cell Yes, Bushes, the Gibson. <laughs> Gibson, yes. Jack Gibson. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was probably good for it, too. Yes, and oh, if yeah. he didn't, he could give your grandpa a tissue that he could wipe the tears yeah. out. <laughs> uh, your, I remember, John, your grandfather... Uh, he was a good businessman. Uh, besides uh, uh, the restaurant, he ran the booth at the hockey arena, mm -hmm. as you know. Yes. Well, yes. i got to let you in on a little ploy. I was too young, but uh, it was well known that, that your grandfather would load a sleigh up and mm -hmm. carry chocolate bars and, <laughs> and the hot dogs and so on over, and the bulk food over uh, to the booth every night. And a couple boys who were seven, six, years older than me, they would say, I'll help you, Mr. Brown, I'll help you pull your sleigh, and one would get each side of them helping them pull the sleigh, and two or three others would be behind kicking the chocolate bars <laughs> off into the snow. <laughs> so, if I had been in on it, I'd pay you for those bars right now, but I wasn't. Sure you would. Uh, yeah. And I know that your grandfather probably knew exactly what was happening, Absolutely, because yes. he was not... Uh, it was not in any sense of the word no, uh, no, naive, no. but he seemed to let them away with it anyhow. Uh, your, your father, what did he do for a living, uh, John? He was with Ontario Hydro. He started out in the Royal Bank, 
And when he was overseas, he came down with the flu and came to pneumonia. He wasn't very well. Well, the was doctor, he traveling overseas or? Uh, well, he was in the tank corps. Oh, this would be in the uh, 1914 to 18. Yes. I see. First unpleasantness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And, uh, I knew that's what it was, but I wanted you to tell Oh, me. all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, the First World War. Yeah, the First World War, yeah. And uh, when he came back, the doctor said he would, should get work outside. So he became a purchasing agent for the Canada Cement Company. He bought uh, high explosives and blasting caps and all that, and he was in charge of, you know, you, what he wants to stick it down like a boot, and then you, you come to see Sam Grill, so he gives it to you, all right? Well then, the down to cement folded, but they kept the office staff on for a year oh. at half pay. He was a half pay officer. And uh, then he worked all over. He worked, uh, he worked at the Gordon Boat Company, and Mother and I lived in a tent all summer in Bob Cajun. Oh, he, uh, he worked up in Bob Cajun with the Gordon. With the Gordon Pope. They were originally in Lakefield, yes, were they I not? Know. And mm -hmm. then they moved to Cajun. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh -huh. And he got a job keeping books for a construction company in Parry Sound. Uh, we stayed down here. He went to Parry Sound. We went up to see him once. We went to see the Quinto Quince. They just been born. Then he got on with Ontario Hydro in November 1936. Yeah. What was? Did them. you see the Quince, John? Yes. What was your impression of them? <laughs> Oh, they were a little weak. Well, they'd be Catholic for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were French Catholics. <laughs> Watch what Grandpa Brown think of that. Well, Grandpa Brown. All right, now, just a second. Grandpa Brown's. I've got to get this straight now. His mother's name was Isabella Kells, and she came from Cavan. Now, the, they were very famous people in Cavan. You know what they wear? They were blazers. <laughs> the Kells were cabin blazers. Uh -huh. Yeah. They used to just burn them right out. Yeah. Tie them onto the toll gates. And was Grandpa an orangeman? An, was he an orangeman? <laughs> oh, oh, Lord, yes. He was an orangeman. Listen, the Browns and the Kells, and my grandmother Brown's maiden name was Nugent, they thought that the greatest event in the world took place on July the 12th, 1690, when the Prince of Orange defeated James II <laughs> and established the Protestant succession to the throne. There was no other. He celebrated it every year, the 12th of July. Ooh, ooh, uh, Grandpa Herb. Yes. He, he went to every Orange Walk, even if he could only go a couple blocks, drop out of the parade, and get in a car and speed off to wherever they were going to be. Uh -huh. Well, we've got him covered. <laughs> well, <laughs> my um, grandmother's, uh, grandmother Brown's father, he's uh, Mr. Nugent, grandpa, great grandpa Nugent, and uh, uh, we used to go down, with the, down and stay a week with them down. They had a big farm down in uh, Rayboro. And uh, one time, he was in his 80s, and he was fixing a piece of farm machinery. And he, he'd put the wheel on there. It was like a Laurel and Hardy movie. Then the other wheel would fall off. And then he put that one on. And he kept working on the thing. And he put it down the thick. And he turned to me and he said, well, to hell with the Pope and Patty McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't hear that again. Did anybody go down to hear that play at the... Yeah. 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 You that, heard they you know? used that expression. Yeah, they kept yelling that thing. And I didn't know that that's where I'd first heard it. I was only 10 years old and I was in my late 60s. When, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I knew your grandfather, and I'm sure Elmer and Jean Jackman and uh, Elmer Graham and all those did business with your grandfather. Mm -hmm. I thought he was a fine man, so uh, we asked these questions. It's nice to hear what uh, the grandson... You know that in all the years I knew him, and I was 30-something when he died, he only spoke harshly to me once. That was when he found out that I had paid fifty dollars for Von Haven's Jet Cavalier. That was a pedigreed Cocker Spaniel I bought. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, as my cousin Bass said, if he knew he'd pay 900 for Blarm Squire Livingstone, he'd probably shot me right on, the, yeah. right on the spot. Well, your father and mother bought a dog one time from your aunt, did they not? Oh. <laughs> well, yes, they... A famous dog in Lakeville. Good, good uh, history. Yeah, yes, and that was an excellent Tell dog. Tell us about that one. Well, uh, my Aunt Eileen, uh, she married a, her first husband. That tells you something right there. Uh, it's a guy called, by the name of Jimmy Welch. And they lived over in Judge Collins's place. Okay? Uh -huh. So, anyway, uh, they, had, they bought this registered Irish setter. Beautiful dog. And they were going to breed the dog. So Dad said, I'll, I want one of the pups. I want to buy one of the pups. So the pups were duly born. And Jimmy and Eileen decided they wanted to go to the depression. Was they wanted to go to Toronto. So they needed 40 bucks. So they brought the little dog over and put him down, thing, and the dog was coal black. <laughs> coal black. And Dad said, well, this is supposed to be an Irish setter. And Eileen always had an answer. She said, all Irish setters are black when they're born. <laughs> At the end of a year, the black fur goes out and the red fur comes in. Well, Dad had never heard that one, but it was a, a sweet little dog, and he wasn't going to that. I gave him those <laughs> bucks. And several days later, he got a collar and leash, and he takes the dog downtown. And he meets Charlie Thompson, the tailor. Charles Ridpath's grandfather, Molly's father. Molly, yes, Molly's father, that's right, Charlie Ridpath's grandfather. Charlie looks at the dog, he said, did you buy one of those dogs? Dad said, yes. He says, got quite an ancestry. <laughs> Dad said, what do you know about it? Well, he says it took place in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> Dad says, who's the father? <laughs> he said, Bill Charlton's Great Dane Duke. <laughs> <laughs> we just thought we'd spring that one on you, Carl. <laughs> John, thank you for that. Now, uh, were the the Browns and the Grills, were they of any, uh, like, uh, uh, devout political adherents, uh, more or less? Uh, yes, they you were. have already admitted two mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> no, they were, they were Tories. Through and through. Now, you had an uncle who was... Uh, uh, Beth McMaster's father, yeah, Uncle, Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack. Uh huh. And uh, I knew Uncle Jack uh, briefly when he was in Lakefield. Maybe you'd just tell him he was a very accomplished man. Though. Yes, he uh, was uh, Reba Bancroft anytime he wanted the job. <laughs> he was warden of the county of Hastings. He was instrumental in, put, in arranging the big extension onto the Belleville General Hospital. The airport is called Jack Brown Airport. that okay? That's that's wonderful. <laughs> All right. That's the type of things I was wanting you to tell us. All right. Because he was a Lakefield boy. You know? Oh, yes. Oh, and yes. we're very interested in the oh, success yes. of Lakefield yes. people. Yeah. One of our Lakefield uh, uh, people has gone on to be, uh, uh, say, a founding mother of show place. You know anything yes. about that lady? Yes, yes, I know her well. <laughs> I know her well. Could you give us a little description of her? <laughs> She was uh, Beth Brown, I believe. That's right. Yeah. She married Stuart McMaster. She was teacher, writer, author. Uh, she arranged for you know, show plays. She was the big thing. And she's one. right here with us this evening. She's right here. <laughs> Way back from Beth. Nice you, 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 might, you might mention that I'm now chair of United Way. Would they please all give? Yes. <laughs> That's only after they join here. <laughs> John, we're going to get back to you. You yeah. personally, and uh, we don't want this to be embarrassing at all. What year were you born? 1929. 1929. Now, my parents were married in 1926, and I was born in 1929, so there's no yeah. stamp <laughs> well, whatsoever connected no. with me. No. All right. Fine. Well, at that stage. Yeah. yeah. But I want to show you one oh, little my. thing here. Like, oh, I... Uh, we have a photo here, <laughs> and it's taken of John David Grills and Gene Spence, 1932, and he's got a grin on his face, and Gene has her skirt up. Now, yeah. 
<laughs> I'd like to pass it around uh, just while we're talking. Here. I have I have a birthday party picture. In fact, I'm going to give you that one, and I'm going to pass Jean this one. Has, <laughs> Jean has her. She's, she's got her sweater off. That, her skirt up at yeah. that. That's the birthday party picture. And so that's, I, she mentioned it one time, and I said, well, why do you think we invited you to the party? <laughs> That's why she got to so many parties? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've known Jean for a long time, and she's a she's a decent girl. I think there's any problem here at Jean. Yeah. Well, I'm the one that's got the grin on his face. <laughs> uh, John, uh, where were you born? What house? Do you remember? Or I was born at the old Nichols Hospital. In the Sorry. Nichols Hospital. That's right. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and uh, who was the attending doctor? Dr. Housen. Dr. Hudson, mm -hmm. right? and uh, how many different houses have you lived in Lakefield in your period of time? Well, we houses. Well, we just we the dad bought the house over here in 1931, and I we on there King Street. Oh, yeah. Street. Oh, yeah. now we, they we, they did have that apartment over the Royal yeah. Bank and the tent. Oh yeah, the tent. Yeah. Oh, I better tell you a little bit. Just a second now about the apartment. We rented the apartment from from Billy Caseman. Whose mother was a Nelson? Was a Nelson. So he, kept, he kept coming back to the Nelson. That's right. This was round two of the Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> round two. <laughs> and uh, what was Mr. Caseman? He must have been a friend of the family, also. Huh? I don't know, but well, mother, he had mother, a big funeral. He was a well-liked man. Oh yes, it was. This, listen. Casement's funeral was the social event of 1938. Yes. Everybody. They wished he'd have died sooner because 37 was a dry year. Yes. <laughs> yes, he was. Uh, he um, was a big, one of the biggest funerals ever held in Lakefield. That's history. right. They had members of parliament, senators, judges, magistrates. Yeah. And. Uh, Okay, and was he of the the uh, conservative faith? No, also? he was not. <laughs> He was a Brit. <laughs> I see. Okay. Oh, just a second. His very best friend was Dr. J.R. Fraser. And Dr. J.R. Fraser, and when they called an election, they didn't speak. J.R. Fraser and Billy Caseman did not speak from the time they issued the Queen's ele King's election writ until after the election. They didn't speak. They didn't speak. They never speak. After the election, they became best friends. Uh, isn't that something? Uh, John, as most of you know, uh, some of us had uh, 10, 15, 17 years of school life. John had 43, 44 years of school days. Uh, he was just a little slow, that's why. Yeah! He <laughs> <laughs> wasn't too slow I, here. I, I knew what you were up to. <laughs> When you first started, like going back to your Lakefield days, your first teacher? Kindergarten? I miss kid. Miss kid. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, who was the principal of the public school in those days? Um, T.W. De Chaplin. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, you'd get good marks. He was a neighbor. <laughs> not, not then he wasn't. Oh, he wasn't. No, he was oh. up on the hill then. I see. Yeah. I just met a lady this evening who lives in their home. Just oh, yes. Living yes. in their yeah. home. <laughs> Mrs. Jefferson. Yeah, Mrs. Jefferson. Kathy. Yes. And uh, the, uh, no doubt in public school you had uh, many outstanding teachers, didn't you? Do you care to I, comment I, on any? I had three, three outstanding teachers. The first was, and by the way, they're all still living. I had Thelma Kerveth Medill. I'm going to call her Thelma. And she got the interest that I was always in plays throughout high school and all this. And you know, that, it has to have a, a beginning. So the first play I was in was a Halloween play, just time of year, and Greg Knox drew a, um, a wagon loaded with pumpkins across the stage, and Hastings Wong said, oh look, a wagon. <laughs> now wait for it. <laughs> My line was, a red one. <laughs> That's it. That was it. A red one. <laughs> then we put on the Pied Piper of Hamlin, and John Twist was the Pied Piper, and Greg Knox was the mayor, 
and I was one of the four counselors, and all the other kids were rats. <laughs> they <laughs> went squeaking around. Yeah. And uh, Thelma said it, thought it would be nice if the boys all had long trousers. Well, boys didn't wear long trousers. They wore briefs. God, I hated them. I, I don't, I'm not very fond of trousers either. <laughs> so anyway, I, I said, well, I, uh, I, have, I have long trousers. I can wear them. I kind of looked at me. Now, my father's sister had sent me a cobbler suit <laughs> with long thing and chaps, <laughs> uh, kerchief, uh, yeah. check shirt, hat, and a holster, two, a holster with yeah. two, two holsters. Hopalong grills. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have, uh, mother's away in Toronto visiting her cousin, and I go home and I said to dad, I'm in a play and I have to wear my cowboy suit. Oh, fine, we didn't even argue, make a federal case out of that. <laughs> Hang on, I walked into the room. I put the thing on, put uh, the suit on, everything like that. But I even had the cap guns and everything, two of them, nickel plated. And, uh, well, there you go. I, I look more like Tom Mix than I did the counselor. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, uh, but you would make an impression upon your classmates. Oh, yes. I guess so. Yes. Uh, uh, John, uh, then you uh, got through public school. Did you get a recommendation, do you know? No, I never got recommended writing in my life. <laughs> no. no. Huh. I had uh, to write my entrance. My mother was weeks getting over that. <laughs> I had to write my entrance. You know, like the dumb kids had to do that. Well, you did pretty well. You, you, uh, perseverance and, uh, and application will no. make up for a lot of uh, education, won't it? Uh, one, one thing that, that happened in, in Thelma Medill's room, uh, the Berlin Olympics were on, 1936. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. And she thought it would be very nice if we made a scrapbook. You know, uh, anybody could make a scrapbook. So I, I got access to papers and I had a beautiful scrapbook. She only gave me a B. <laughs> and then when I looked at it, oh, I'll talk about it later on, the only way I could possibly have gotten an A for that scrap was if I had a member of the Hitler Youth. <laughs> because it was full of pictures of Hitler and Hess and Gary and all those I guys. See. I don't even think Jesse Owens got into it. <laughs> no. uh, that's... Uh, when you went into high school, uh, who was the principal of the high school? J.R. Harvey. Yeah. And the high school in those days was uh, a joint building with the public school? That's right. So uh, almost uh, everybody in each public and high knew one another. Oh, yeah. Oh, another, yeah. Huh? That's right. And uh, Mr. Harvey was your, there. And who were some of your uh, memorable high school teachers? Well, Mr. Harvey was one. He was a fantastic Shakespeare teacher. Oh, was he? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. My goodness, and he made us memorize. So. Oh, I see. That's what I was wanting to ask you. Yeah, can you recite any poetry that you earned, learned in either public or high school? <laughs> well, we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John, uh, how about the facilities? I know it was a modern school. There was central air, uh, no doubt. <laughs> We're up here? <laughs> public and high school. Uh, Any comments on the facilities? Well, they were the better than the ones I got out in the rural schools, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> okay. But, uh, they were, yeah, they were good. They had running yeah. water and all that sort of thing. Okay. Where did you have your commencement exercises, your oh, graduation? Uh, the um, town hall. In the town hall. Yeah. Eh? The, and uh, the classmates, who were your, some of your contemporaries? Well, there was Greg Knox, Jack Chitty. Uh, Betsy Hurst, Don Nichols. Okay, how did you, uh, uh, by that time you had bypassed Jean, eh? Jean. Well, she was there. I was way ahead of him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Remember one thing, Jean, was, uh, Jean is older than I am. <laughs> George Kelly, a classmate of yours? He was a class behind. Or two classmates. Class behind. I see. <laughs> John, did you take part in the Army Cadets then? Yes, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. any, any well, we thoughts won, on them? Or? Well, we won the war. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to make any comment about it. Okay. Um, I had, um, I had, um, we can get back to the public school bit. Um, 
I, I was very fortunate, 1937 and 38, and 38 and 39, I was in grade four and grade five, and I, I, had, I was taught by Robert Spence. And I think I owe more to that man than I know, know to anybody else in education. I learned more pedagogy from him, just remembering things that he did, than I ever learned at the Who Peter was Bernard. Robert Spence? That girl's big brother. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a teacher? Uh, he was a teacher. Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, yes uh, he was uh, wonderful. Uh, he got uh, us uh, reading, uh, and he went into his room, and, and the first of September, first day of September, and the room was all decorated up. Not, nothing more soul damning to have a kid go in a room that's nothing, just nothing. He got us interested in stamps, he got us interested in, I was, I was always interested in maps, still am. He had maps and posters, and uh, he was always sending away getting things for us. Booklets on this, booklets on that. He'd be doing that with his own money in those days, would he not? I don't know. It could have been samples. I know. I remember one day he came in and we all got a sample bar of Life Boy soap. Now maybe he was trying to tell us something. <laughs> I don't know. It could have been. Uh -huh. And um, he taught us folk dancing. Folk dancing. I and we, you know, I danced on the stage. Well, I wasn't the only one. There was a whole crew of us doing a folk dance. I danced with Connie's late sister Winnie. And the, at the town hall? Yeah, right in the town hall there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, um, in one of the geographics, uh, I remember following, uh, he had all these old National Geographics, and we used to go and get those. And, uh, the, the explorations of Roy Chapman Andrews. Do you know, about four months ago, somebody came up with a book on the life of Roy Chapman Andrews? And I thought, oh, God, I remember he learned about him from Bob Spence. <laughs> so I went down to Edna. And they got me the book and doing a second reading on it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's nice. And uh, uh, it, it was a, bit, a memorable time. Uh, September 1938, and a certain man said, He told me yesterday, and today he has issued a statement that after the Sudeten German question is settled, that is the end of Germany's territorial demands in Europe. Munich. <laughs> Boy, Bob really taught us that. The Munich uh -huh. business, yeah. Right. Okay, uh, we actually don't want to get into everything that you did learn. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Go on. We can't cover the whole curriculum. All right. <laughs> Following high school, what did you do? Went to Peterborough Normal School. Yeah. Now tell me this. I'm. Uh, I when I came along, it was Teachers College. Why did they call it Normal School? Was there a school for the abnormal? No. <laughs> I think it came from the ex French expression "école normale." I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, but that would still mean normal school in French. That's right. And why? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, like Red Path School. The kids up there know why they call it Red Path. I certainly hope they yeah. do. John, your music. Yeah. When did you develop uh, an interest in music? Well, I took I studied with my great aunt, um, Miss Grill. Miss Grill, and then she um, sort of thought I should move on a little bit. So, uh, mother called G. Winder Smith up at the Grove School to see if I could take a lesson from Agnes Logan Green, who is still alive, and. Um, so Mr. Smith said, we have a vacancy, but he has to realize that if a, if a student at the school wants it, he will be bumped. I studied with her for a year and a half before somebody wanted that space, so that was lucky. Yeah. Did you study piano or, piano, or yeah. music in general? Or no, what? piano, but uh, with Agnes Golden Green. I see. Then yeah. I studied with the nuns at St. Cecilia's Convent. Uh -huh. Then I was doing music seriously, taking theory and harmony and form and counterpoint and all those. Oh, I well know those things. <laughs> uh, John, when you graduated from uh, normal school, were there any other Lakefield uh, students in your class? Yes, we had Greg Knox. Oh, yeah. Uh, Mary Spencer Dubchek. Uh huh. Doreen Crow. Okay. Uh huh. They all went. They had all gone to Lakefield High School. The four of us all were in grade thirteen at Lakefield High School. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, so you get out of uh, normal school, and uh, your first job, Lang. I taught at Lang. 
Uh huh. Down where the uh, uh, Century Village is yes, now. Yes, that's right. Uh huh. And uh, big paying job, John. One hundred and fifty-five dollars a month for ten months. Fifteen hundred and fifty a year. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Ten percent to the teacher superannuation. That's right. <laughs> and, yeah, and by the and by the way, you had to set enough aside to go to summer school. <laughs> you had to go to summer school. You bet you did. If you were going to get anywhere in teaching, you had to go to summer school. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How'd you get that job? Did you have Paul? What? Lang? <laughs> <laughs> no, they just came and <laughs> just like a. Slave market. <laughs> you were spoken for, eh? Oh, yeah. yeah. How many pupils did you have in the group? I had 45 students in eighth grades. I had about five or six in the entrance class, and they had to write the examination because a first year teacher could not recommend students. Oh, I see. Uh huh. And I had about I had 10 beginners. They oh, didn't yeah. know how to put their clothes on. <laughs> oh, my God. How did you get all the lessons? Like, you could only teach one lesson for, uh, how did you, a lot of homework at nights? No. Uh, a lot of lesson plans, eh? And, uh, of course. You know, all the time I was down there two years, and not one time did I ever have anybody say, you know, we're going to have to send some help in to John Brill. <laughs> no. Well, no. Right. no, they no. didn't say that. No, they didn't, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, the uh, facilities, they pretty up to date? Well, it was. There's always a fresh pail of water there? Yes. Yeah. Pail of day toilets. <laughs> pail of day now. Um. Uh, John, then you went uh, from there, you say, to. Uh, uh, Number six Dural. Number six Dural. Or okay. Pine Hill. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, how long were you there? Two years. Uh huh. And. Uh, how long were you at Lang? Two. Yeah. How long do you, how many years would you say it takes a teacher to wear out their welcome? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, <John. laughs> I don't know. I know. No, never. Never. Uh, you'd be a great teacher, I know that, John. So, you like your pupils and you want to see them successful, so that, uh, there's what two good qualities. Sick, uh, excuse me? What happens if you got sick? What happens if you got sick? What would happen Illness. to the school class? Oh, they'd bring a supply teacher in. Would they? Oh, yeah. Uh, K.O. Birkin had a whole slew of them there. He shipped them out. <laughs> John, eventually you went on and you uh, got your a degree, a Bachelor of Arts degree? Or, uh -huh. And did you have a major in it? or? I majored in history and minored in English. I went to Western. I know that. Yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> but, but so, and what year did you finish your degree, John? Class of '62. '62. Uh -huh. Oh, congratulations! That was uh, a lot of summer spent. And I know you told me one time that you had the pleasure of spending a summer studying American history at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. That's right. That'd be a nice experience. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, when you were a child, uh, your family doctor was Dr. whom? Oh, Dr. Alec Fraser. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, did he not educate your father in, uh, in uh, anesthesiology? My grandfather. Oh, your grandfather. Could yeah, you they, share that story they, with the people? Because he, Dr. Fraser was a famous village doctor. He, he saved more lives in this village than you never imagined, yeah. and probably uh, euchred a few also. <laughs> 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 but anyhow. Tell us that story, Jeff. Uh, Dr. J.R. Fraser. No, that was Dr. Alec Fraser. Okay. And his father was Dr. J.R. Fraser. He was sort of semi-retired. Now, in those days, they used to put, they used to take your tonsils out on the kitchen table. J.R. would come over, the old man, and he'd give you the give the anesthetic. Well, and then Alec had yanked the tonsils out, and that was it. Well, my aunt Elizabeth, or Betty as they called her, had to have her tonsils out, so... Alec came over, but he came over by himself. And Grandma said, well, where's your, where's your father? Oh, he says, you don't even pay him ten dollars. He said, I can show Herb how to give an anesthetic. <laughs> My grandfather, I'll show Herb how to give an anesthetic. So he put a mask and gown on him and all this. And he said, now, Herb, I'm going to scrub up and you 
when I tell you to put so many drops on the thing, put it over. And he always called her the girl. You were always the girl or the boy. He never called you by name. Oh. <laughs> and so anyway, he puts the thing, you know, so many drops, and finally she went, and Alec pulled the tonsils out. Well, she was just a little girl. My grandmother was thought she'd spend, stay with her that night, you know, sleep with her. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, there's a knee in my grandmother's back and a flashlight in her face. And Dr. Relic says, don't move, Mrs. Brown. I just want to check the girl's throat. <laughs> At 3 o'clock in the morning, he'd walked into the house, found the room, kneed, put her knee. Right? My grandmother was terrified. <laughs> But at least he was making house calls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> John, who was your dentist when you were a child? Dr. Dr. Renwick? Dr. Campbell? I, I had them both Dr. from Kitchen. time to time, but I, I went to Dr. C Dr. J.J. Craig in Peterborough. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, I see. And where did you buy most of your groceries? Any particular store? We used to go to Spence's. We bought this, and we went to... Uh, Crawford's Butcher Shop. Okay, yeah. Theodore, right? Eh? No, no. Oh, oh yeah, Teddy. Teddy. Teddy, yeah. Teddy, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, who'd you get your milk from? I can tell you that. First he was darling. a next door neighbor. First oh, Darling. First Darling, okay. Yeah. And then Charlie Hunter, no doubt. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. so. He was a successor to Percy. Oh, no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. No. No. Uh, okay. No. Uh, you're a shoemaker? Did you have your shoe, uh, shoes repaired in those days? Mm -hmm. Or did you just go out and buy new? Glenn. 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 Maybe. Yes. I forgot about that. Did you ever have a pair of shoes half sold or anything? Oh, yes. Lots of Glenn time. Wanamaker. Glenn Wanamaker. Glenn Wanamaker. And uh, Mr. Chappell. Walter Chappell yeah. used to do right. work before yeah. he went to the... Uh, yeah. And your druggist? Where did you buy any oh, of your sundries? E.H. Uh -huh. Northey. E.H. Northey. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, what was the prominent funeral homes when you were uh, a <coughs> child? Uh, where was there one or more? Or? Well, there there weren't any. They waked you in the house. Okay. So the uh, any of your family have the wakes in the house? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, most of them probably. Yeah. Did. And who uh, did the uh, attendance of the? the the Henry Funeral Home? No. Um, Webster's. Yeah. Webster's were there. Okay. And, um, well, then, then the Henry's, yes. Yeah. Yeah. What type of fuel did you burn in your house? What did you use for fuel? Wood? Yes, and then coal. Coal? Yeah. Uh -huh. used to buy and and where did you buy your uh, wood? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> where did you get your coal? Oh, we. Well, yeah, yeah. um, Probably W.J. Charles. W.J. Charles, yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Any bus service when you were a child? Anything Wonderful you bus service. Okay. Peterborough, 615, 715, 815. Where'd you catch it? Um, usually the uh, Northeast Drugstore. They bus had the concession to sell the tickets. Okay. What bus line was it? Ferguson? Oh, yeah. During wartime. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. And uh, taxis. Did you ever use taxis or anything like that? <coughs> Not in late. Did your family have a car? No, we didn't. Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, but you don't... Did you have a cottage? Did your family have yeah, a Yeah, we, we had a cottage. And where was it, John? It was at, up in, on Clear Lake. And uh, my dad had been, just gotten a job with Ontario Hydro in 1936. The first thing we had to do was pay the mortgage off on the house, which we did. Then... My uh, dad, best father, came to see dad when he said, I want you to buy a lot on Clear Lake. It's going to cost you $150. Dad says, I haven't $150. He said, you can't afford not to buy it. Uncle Jack had bought two lots and he, from Joe I, and he asked Joe to build a, rail, a road in. And Joe says, I'm not building a road in for two lots. Well, he said, if I sell two more, can you, will you build a road? Yes, he built a road in for four lots. So, <coughs> Dad was walking down the street and he met Jay McKercher, John McKercher, the bank manager. Uh -huh. And he said to him, there's no way the Royal Bank would lend me $150, is there? And he says, of course they will, get in here. <laughs> Dad walked out with $150 and bought the, bought the lot. Yeah. 
And do you know that lot now is probably worth a thousand times that? Oh, I know. Hundred fifty thousand. I know. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you ever uh, take a train ride when you were a child in Lakefield? Did you ever ride the train from Lakefield? The one thing my mother wanted me to, two things my mother wanted me before I started school. She wanted me to have a ride on a train, and she wanted me to see an orange parade. <laughs> and the capital city of Orangeism was Lindsay. Oh, yeah, every year. Uh, yeah. So we, they ran a special train from Lakefield to Peterborough to Lindsay. And that was the first train trip. Did Grandpa go on it with you? Or do you remember? Uh, he was in the parade. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't remember uh, being on the train. Yeah. I'm just trying to trigger some memories of your childhood, John. What are any memories of the pavilion, uh, oh, yeah. dance pavilion? Oh yes, when I was in high school, we used to dance at the pavilion. Oh, okay. School would have dances at the pavilion. Uh -huh. and we also used to have dances at the um, rotunda of the Lakefield Hotel. Oh. When, when, while Where was the rotunda? Well, the lobby. Oh, okay. Lobby of the Lakefield Hotel. We're more familiar with the latter one. All right, that's fine. Uh, and uh, you had to dance around uh, Butts Northy, C.J. Davis, Norm Hughes, and Walter Colomb, because they were playing bridge every every day. They played bridge. Oh, yeah. There, too. Uh -huh. And they, they had their little place. They never even took the table down. They got there every night. Played bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any memories of any uh, steamboats? Were there any steamboats around? Oh, yes. Do you remember? Yes, I used to go up to the cottage on the island. Oh, did you? Yes. And would it drop you off, pull into the no, dock, or no. go to Forest the Park? No, or? no. I got up at Young's Point and walked. We had a path through the woods. Oh. Uh -huh. That took us to the cottage. I see. When did you dispose of your cottage, John? What year do you remember? Uh, well, let's see. Dad died in 73. I would say the spring of 72. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, okay, uh, Lakefield Fair, any memories of Lakefield Fair? Oh yes, that was a, we used to get a, a half day off to go to Lakefield Fair, and we also got a free ticket. Uh -huh. Oh, I always went there. I still go to Lakefield Ever Fair. Ever win any prizes for exhibits or anything like that? Or? No, I, I don't remember. I don't think I did. No. no. Uh, how about the telephone service? Do you always have a telephone in your home? Just about all the time, yeah. Uh, well, uh, all the time you lived in your home, was it uh, have electricity? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. You must be in some of the influent, because uh, I know many people who can remember when they got the first telephone and when their house was wired, because you were wired years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we... I mean, well... <laughs> uh, Anyway, that's good. All in your memory forever you had that in your home. So it must have been a pretty good home when you... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, now, I remember when we didn't have a phone, but it, I don't think it was for yeah, too long. Yeah. Well, John, uh, that's just about everything that I've asked you without getting... Uh, uh, now, <laughs> this is in jest, but I've been, I've been saying that I was going to do this, and I've been telling everybody I was going to do this. John and I had an agreement <laughs> that I would not ask him anything but a sex life. <laughs> However, at this time, I'd like to take the opportunity to see if he'd like to volunteer anything about the sex life. <laughs> anyway, enough of that, John. Enough of that, John. <laughs> uh, John, uh, I have finished my questioning of you. I just had to get that so you can comment in, John. Uh, I was uh, waiting for it. Okay. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, some things I'm sure that you would like to share with the group that I haven't asked uh, you. I don't, I don't really know. I think you've covered covered everything very well. Um, uh, would you be entertaining some questions then, maybe from the audience? Sure. Yeah. Uh, Mary, please. I just wondered if you could talk briefly about the canoe building that your grandfather was involved in and his captain work on the steamship. Well, he uh, was uh, a canoe builder, as you have stated. And um, all the canoe people were in the, the Lakefield Canoe Company. And every time they had the deer hunt, they closed the canoe <laughs> company. They all went on the deer hunt. So they went, they went on the deer hunt. When they came back, J.G. <coughs> Brown had co made copies of all the blueprints and set himself up in the Brown Boat Company <laughs> in Mrs. Jefferson's barn. 
So you, they're not just skunks there, Mrs. Jefferson. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and uh, so that's... Um, that was how Brown's Boat Company got started. That's how it got started. <laughs> oh. uh -huh. Any other... Uh, Harold? Yes, Harold. Uh, John, I, I just wanted to comment. I always enjoyed your father's uh, company uh, when he would be in my dad's blacksmith shop. Uh, a group of the political party that oh. uh, I don't know if they, I think they were on both sides. Sometimes. Yeah, we are. <laughs> and uh, when I was a kid around town, uh, your dad was uh, instrumental in uh, helping me purchase the first 22 I guess I ever had. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember at, before fishing season or hunting season, he always took the gun or the fishing rod to the powerhouse and got it. Yes. Repaired. Yeah, be that's right. Maybe shooting range downstairs and <laughs> to sight the rifle in. And if it was on night shift, you could pick up your shotgun before <laughs> <laughs> Just a little point of it. <laughs> Any other questions? Mary, I, didn't, I don't think I've answered. So your his captain work. His oh, his yes. Work. Well, you see, you make canoes in the wintertime. And that was his job. You sell canoes in the summertime. He was not in the sales end of the canoes. So that's why he got his captain's certificate, so that in the summer he could drive boats. Now, there was a Dr. Race, a, a dentist from Brooklyn, New York, and he used to bring his boats down in the fall. Grandpa would, during the winter, would look after them, you know, repair them and all this sort of thing. And one day, Dr. Race came down. It was quite evident he was very upset about something. And Grandpa said, what, what's the matter? Well, he said, I bought this launch. We've got to deliver it. And he said, they tell me that you can't drive it unless you have a captain's certificate. So my grandfather went to work for him. He worked with him for quite a few years up at his island. He was a general factotum and kept the boats going and drove the launch, all this sort of thing. And then that's that's what he did. Uh, and your grandfather Brown? Grills. Grills. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh -huh. And uh, John, we're living in a modern world here. What do you have any thoughts on amalgamation that we've just had, or any comments you wish to make on that? No, I, I don't like the world situation right now. You know, the mo when I, I, all during the war, you know, they had that the newspapers came out. And uh, it was just all full of war news. Then August 1945, the, the war ended. And there was sort of a vacuum there. Then in 1946, probably one of the most wonderful things happened. A girl in Hamilton cut up her husband. Oh, yes. Evelyn yes. Dick. Yes. Got up her husband. Do I ever wish that some woman would cut up her husband and we could get all that nonsense off the newspapers. Have you seen they just keep banging the pages and doing the same thing? A good axe murder. Or during the war, Sir Harry Oakes was killed, was murdered. They never did find out who did that. Well, spoken like a true bachelor, you'd like to see it. So, uh, uh, John, uh, that certainly would get our minds off the uh, well, event following one. September the 11th. Yes. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for John? Uh, last chance to get them. <laughs> John, you mentioned a ca man by the name of Casement. Uh, is Casement out on uh, Stony Lake? Would that be named after him? Yeah. Well, name, yes, I would say so. Casement Lane. Mm -hmm. You know where that is? Going up to the cemetery? Mm -hmm. Up the hillside? Mm -hmm. yeah. Casement Lane. That was named after him. And he's buried in in, in um, Hillside Cemetery, yeah. and he's in an underground mausoleum. Yeah. He oh. is the same as the day he died. Didn't know could do that. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, he was the postmaster in uh, Lakefield, and I think he was succeeded by your school principal. Yes, Mr. that's right. Chaplin, was Mr. Tom, Tom, Tom Chaplin. And uh, uh, Casement also was a descendant, as you mentioned, of the Nelson. His mother was a Nelson. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
John, uh, he lived with Miss Nelson. Yes, he, yes, yes. Yeah, oh, did he? Oh, yeah, okay. That was his home. Yeah. 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 Well, they were relatives. They were cousins. Is <laughs> 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 it cousins? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, if uh, we haven't any further questions. Oh, John, I want you to mention it's been a large part of your life as your church. Your, your family mm -hmm. has always been uh, involved yeah. in the church. Uh, and, and I just, uh, you've been involved in the church as uh, organist and as an uh, adherent and so on. Uh, what church did you I'm do? a confirmed member. I am not an adherent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's fine. Yeah, so you don't believe, but you belong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when that church was built, three generations of my family worshipped there. My great grandfather, my grandfather, and my father. At the time of it being built? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And three generations of my family served communion in that church. My great grandmother was one of the first woman elders in the United Church. Now, all they let her do was uncover the elements. <laughs> then she had to go and sit down. The men took over. But that was a step in the right direction, I guess. Uh, my mother was a, an elder, and I was on the board. I served communion there, too. So there were three generations, my grandmother, um, my mother, and myself. Yeah, I'm glad we, we covered that uh, because we hadn't. Uh, touched on that. Did you ever, uh, were you an organist in the United Church? I played in Lakefield United Church for three years. I played the organ and Don Landry was the conductor of the choir and then Court McKinney from the Normal School for two years. Okay. okay? Uh -huh. And then I also, I, I have played services in every Protestant church in Lakefield. Uh -huh. And at Warsaw, yeah, I played at St. Mark's Warsaw, I played at St. Aidan's, Young's Point, I played at Young's Point United, and I was two years at Young's Point United, two years at St. Aidan's Anglican Church in Young's Point. And was that to supplement your income? Yes. <laughs> yes, well, you know, these teachers' pensions. <laughs> you got to do something. And the organists are paid a lot, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Sandra. Uh, John, yes. your mother and my mother belong to the young adults. Club that was part of the church, <laughs> and they. I have some wonderful pictures of when they were in plays. Did your mother ever do any writing to do oh, with yeah. plays, or or act in say Peterborough? Okay, first of all, my mother was not a member of the of the Young Adult Society. She used to go and help them with their plays. Oh, okay. I was a member. Um, I was vice president one year and president another year of it, and. Um, they used to put on plays, as you say, and your mother was prominent in the plays. And mother used to direct them. She'd often play in the plays, but she wasn't a member of the young adults, no. Uh, one thing we didn't mention is that for a number of years, uh, your mother was the uh, correspondent reporter for the Peterborough Examiner. 25 years. 25 years. Uh -huh. So a good number of the things that we read in the newspaper, in our research, and so on, from the examiner regarding Lakefield were written by your mother. John, who was the third teacher? You said there were three teachers, and there was Bob and, and, and Thelma. Oh, who was the third one? Marion Comrie. Oh, yes. She came from Keene, and she was very, very up in modern, uh, her methods very, very modern in her methods. Uh, she used to get guest speakers. Now, we were in grade six, you see. She used to get, well, one time, she wanted us to learn about the gold rush. So she invited Charlie Beggle. You know the caretaker? Uh -huh. He was custodian at the school. She had Charlie Beggle. Then a very wonderful man in Lakefield took Dickens' Christmas Carol and made it into a dynamic monologue. <laughs> She had him come and he starts off, Old Marley was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend George Kelly, fantastic. He had the kids eating right out of his hand. Oh. <laughs> then we had a little boy. His parents had sent him from, he, he was, his father was in the colonial administration in Jamaica. 
And you know, they're always worried about the fact that they, there might be a German attack on the Caribbean <coughs> islands. So they, uh, they sent him up here to be with his grandmother. He was only in grade four, and she invited him to uh, come. And by golly, the kid did a good job. Talking about Jamaica. He was only in grade four. Uh -huh. Yeah. One thing you didn't mention, you never mentioned anything about the Wongs, and I don't care which one you were in class, they were always head of the class. Yeah. For years. Yeah. George. And, and Mary, Mary and Lily, Lily, and Rosie, Rosie and Hastings, Hastings and Jesse. Yes. Yeah. They, you couldn't get ahead of them. They, they all did, no matter which one. John, when uh, this has been videotaped, when it has been... Is it in living color? Yeah. Edited <laughs> and purged. In color. No, oh, good. Yeah. When it has been edited and purged. Purged. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on behalf of the uh, members, I'd like to thank you for your attendance. Uh, I, some of the things you said are wonderful and priceless and will be uh, greatly enjoyed by audiences 20, 30, 50 years from now. Thank you very much. My guys. pleasure. Mr. President, you know, your membership's only $10, and I've had more than $10. With fun tonight, I'd like to join. You know that guy. See me after. You know Will Cable, don't you? Yes, I spoke to that gentleman on the phone. They'll probably give you.